There is shadow and there is substance, and this is the root of all things. Of substance, there is only amber, the real city upon the real earth, which contains everything. Of shadow, there is an infinitude of things. Every possibility exists somewhere as a shadow of the real. Amber, by its very existence, has cast such in all directions. And what may one say of it beyond? Shadow extends from amber to chaos, and all things are possible within it. This season of Extra Sci-Fi is sponsored by some of the finest content curators in the game, Curiosity Stream. Want to watch their awesome stuff free for 30 days? Then use the invite code extra credits at the link below. The hall is cold and dark. It is a reflection, found deep, deep in the sea. But here, as in amber, is the pattern. The lines of cold fire that, when walked, granted the ability to move between worlds. A foot sets upon it. He was a lord of amber, one of the nine. One who was part of the pattern. One of those who could, by force of will, step into whatever reality he chose. Or he would be able to, once he walked the pattern. The cool fire coursed up his leg, threatening to engulf him. Each step, his body grew heavier. But pace by pace, he willed himself on. Sparks started to play across his skin. The hair raised on the back of his neck. Then, he felt it. The first veil. An invisible barrier that pushed back against his every step. He had to find a way through, or he would fail. And for those who had the audacity to try to walk the pattern and fail, there was only death. He focused. The world became the line of fire in front of him, and as he pushed through the veil, lost memories came rushing back. He heard the voices at Nuremberg. He had drunken wine by the Great Wall. He had taken scalps on the Western Reserve. He had fled the French Revolution. He took another step. All was death. The smell of decay, of rotting flesh. The fever burned through him. Dead animals in alleys, piled and unburied. He had the plague. He took another step. The second veil pushed back against him. He remembered his brothers and his sisters, fifteen living, eight dead. His boots were encased in fire. His legs were made of lead. Then he remembered Amber, the greatest city, the only true place. Amber with green and golden spires. Amber with its temples and palaces and its flowers of gold and red. Amber from which every other city has taken its shape. Amber. The place where his father ruled. But his father was gone. Vanished. A curve. A line. A few more strides. Then the final veil. It crashed down on him like agony. He was a prince of amber. He could walk the shadows. The throne would be his. Roger Zelazny influenced authors from J.G. Ballard to Neil Gaiman. In fact, Gaiman once said he was perhaps the single greatest influence on him as an author. Yet today, his works are often left as a side note in the canon of sci-fi. In part, this is because his writing is often hard to classify. Is it fantasy? Is it science fiction? Is it something else entirely? Was he part of the new wave or an influence on it? Well, the answer is, his writing is all of those things. He often wrote what we'd consider fantasy, but with modern or science fiction elements, combining genres in a way the Tolkien-influenced fantasy field really hadn't up to this point. Starships or automobiles were as likely to find their way into his work as were unicorns. He also departed from the standard sword and sorcery fantasy to draw inspiration from A Midsummer Night's Dream. He brought fate to the fore, and while his characters certainly get into plenty of fights, they were more pluckish and hotly than the heroes of Lord of the Rings. In fact, for them, the mortal world was often little more than a game board for their schemes. But he also dealt in science fiction, yet his sci-fi would still have elements of folklore or mythology in them drawing questions from traditional religion or philosophy, and then trying to answer them by putting them against the science fiction backdrop. He wrote differently than most of the early fantasy authors, both poetic and base at once. He would couple high language and quotes in Latin with crass expletives and scenes of explosive violence. And he didn't shy away from sex or spiritual questions in his work either. And in this, he inspired many of the other New Wave authors and challenged the notion of what science fiction could be about. He also continually wrestled with the question of whether our perception creates reality, or whether reality exists outside of our perception. Which sounds abstract and academic, and especially when he was writing, it was. But it would become a pressing question 20 years later, as science fiction authors began to come to terms with the very real possibility of humanity creating virtual worlds within the confines of a machine. Which led us to a lot of interesting questions. Is a virtual environment real when you can't distinguish it from reality? If that's true, what ethical questions does it raise? If a group of computer simulations believes themselves to be real and believes the world that they live in to be the real world, what are the ramifications of shutting that simulation off? 
In fact, is there even a meaningful distinction at that point between objective reality and a perfect simulation? Could we even tell from within such a simulation? And then if we could tell, is that simulation in fact perfect? And is there any reason to put more value on or think that real experiences are better than the ones that exist in fully realized worlds, even if they're ones we create? And in reading that last paragraph of questions, I think I just really enjoyably broke my sci-fi brain. But those are the sort of questions that if you read closely, you'll find in Zelazny's tales of fairy princes and magical realms. So if you're looking for a good work of fantasy and you haven't yet read The Chronicles of Amber, it's worth the read. But as you're digging through, don't let the sword fights, car chases, and magic hide the questions it's picking at between the lines. Thank you to Curiosity Stream for sponsoring this season of Extra Sci-Fi. Their cultivated platform of documentaries and nonfiction titles spans a gamut of topics across science, nature, history, technology, society, and lifestyle. In fact, I lost myself in one particularly saucy literary look back, entitled Frankenstein and the Vampire, A Dark and Stormy Night, which recounts a fateful evening that birthed not only the modern vampire myth, but also the tale that started our Extra Sci-Fi series, and of course science fiction proper, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Cue like and crash. Thank you. And you can bring learning to life with unlimited access to this and other amazing stories starting at just $2.99 a month or $19.99 a year. Plus, if you head to curiositystream.com slash extra credits and use the invite code extra credits, you can even get your first 30 days free.